Um, my name is Dorian. If you don't know me and what I'm about, uh, I can say something like, uh, I help companies uh, uh, develop uh, formal models of mm -hmm. processes and structures. And by processes, I mean at all scales. So macro processes, uh, demographic, economic, even geopolitical, uh, in which organizations are situated. Uh, business processes uh, uh, that uh, organizations themselves carry out. Uh, and then sub process within, within those processes, so interactions between customers, users, products, services, et cetera, and even more fine grain than that. And by structures, I mean the things that are affected by these processes, whether they are actor, prop, or scenery. Um, and since we're talking about models, these structures either represent something out in the world, so people, companies, products, events, or they don't. They're purely conceptual entities that exist inside information systems. Um, and finally, by formal, I mean models are capable of being manipulated directly by a computer. So that hopefully gives you a sense of my point of departure. Uh, every project, at least every project I've ever encountered, has a part of its anatomy that goes like desired outcome to specific method. And the job of any project is to map the desired outcome to the specific method. And in software, once you've got this specific method, you're done. It's not like a building where you get the blueprints drawn up. Uh, and you go and build the building, because uh, in software, of course, as we all know, in digital media, the blueprint is the building because the code is the blueprint. So the question is, uh, how do we do the part in the middle, the this mapping part? Uh, because that part is by definition different for, for every project. Um, a project by definition has some uncertainty associated with it, because if it didn't, it would just be a, something you do. It wouldn't be a project. So the answer to this question for software, I believe, goes something like this. At the outside, uh, we've got desired outcomes, but I want to refine that a little bit better and call this business goals. And of course, by business, I just mean it in the broadest possible sense. So if it's a company, then that's make money. If it's not, you know, it can be some kind of mission driven thing. Um, it's just sort of like how it interfaces with the outside world. Uh, we then intersect the business goals with user goals. And of course, standard disclaimer, the user uh, and the customer are not necessarily the same person. We could trot out the standard uh, examples, cat food, diapers, whatever. Um, the salient bit, is that the user is the one you have to satisfy in order to satisfy the customer in order to satisfy the business goals. So we proceed onward and inward from user goals to user tasks. Again, you know, this is Cooperism, right? The task is not a goal. Uh, a task is whatever you have to do in order to achieve a goal. And then we move from user tasks to system tasks. Uh, this is what the system has to do. Uh, in order to support the user in the completion of their task in order to achieve the goal to the extent that it coincides, intersects with the business goals. Uh, then we proceed along to system behaviors. These are the fine-grained prescriptions and proscriptions, rules about what must happen or what must not happen uh, while the system is carrying out its end of the task. And then finally, at the very end of the specificity gradient, we've got code. Now, I'm going to submit that the race to get to code, we forget about all of the value generated from all of these layers up here. Um, and I'm going to footnote as well that what I have just described is not a process per se. Um, this is not a step-by-step -step instruction manual, although, I mean, it's going to have a general sense kind of like that. Rather, it's a taxonomy or typology. It's a categorization scheme. 
the specificity gradient is kind of like a coin sorter. Um, I'm sure we've seen these before. This is a particularly old one. I thought it was kind of cool. Um, but, uh, you know, there's the bucket types and the rail types, and they have, generally, they operate on the same principle. You get a bunch of holes that are the size of the coins, and then you put the biggest ones at one end and the, and the smallest holes at the other end, and you either shake it or you roll the coins down a rail, uh, and they fall into the holes, and then they come out sorted. Uh, in any organization, there's going to be work product uh, that uh, is going to settle on one of these layers or another. And each layer represents a level or range of detail which correlates with a zone of perishability. And there's also kind of an increasing level of interiority as well um, as a side effect of the detail. So the outsides are more, uh, uh, they relate more to the average person and then the, the farther, one, uh, farther ones down are, are more esoteric and they're more the domain of specialists. So let's examine what I mean by looking at each layer. Uh, the way that an organization, of course, interfaces with the public is through products and services. Unless you're Google, uh, a product is an extremely long-lived thing. Uh, individual products typically stick around for decades. And then when you get out of tech, uh, there's product categories that last even longer. So like car companies, for example, have been making cars for over a century now. Uh, you know, it's probably going to be another century before we get rid of them entirely. Uh, if they're sophisticated too, the company's going to have like a, uh, tracking all sorts of, of, of things happening in the world. So again, gem demographic trends, geopolitical uh, court cases, laws going through, uh, you know, Congress or Parliament um, and, and so on, the market, competitors, et cetera. Now, you could say that the events each have their own temporal logic, but the model the organization creates to track them is persistent. Um, and in fact, the, the strategic sort of situa uh, situational awareness model is typically bigger, ultimately slower thing than any one product. And then, of course, you've got the like value statements and the brand and all that kind of stuff, which really doesn't move very fast. Uh, at the scale of user goals, um, one interface between business goals and user goals is a persona. And if you don't like persona, there's like analogous things, you know, some kind of entity that you're going to target, some kind of archetypal person. Um, these are likely to be informed by the strategic model I just mentioned. Um, analogously, there's no reason in principle why a persona, um, oops, uh, why a persona couldn't last decades as well. There's no reason why a persona couldn't transcend products in principle. Uh, and there's no reason why an organization couldn't have an entire stable uh, of personas uh, that product teams could select from. Um, so user tasks, uh, that's at this scale, uh, something like a scenario. And again, if you don't like scenario, storyboard, uh, some kind of procedural thing. They're going to animate the personas into, you know, into model the coarse grain process of getting something done. Uh, you can write a scenario in a way that doesn't over prescribe too precisely how the persona accomplishes what it's done. Like if a goal is to watch a movie in a theater, the task is to buy movie tickets. And then you can explore precisely how, you know, a person buys movie tickets through different media and technology. So how do they do it in person? How do they do it on a desktop computer? How do they do it on a phone? You know, Apple Watch, Amazon Alexa, GPT-47, whatever. Um, and then possibly the interoperation between those uh, during the process. Um, so you can have the abstract process of buying movie tickets, which you can add detail to uh, about the specific way you go about buying them. And then when new technologies come along, you just add them to the pile. Uh, when we get into system tasks, we begin to get a sense of the contours of what like the system even is. Uh, again, this stratifies. So any system is going to have like an abstract structure uh, in order to uh, support and respond to certain processes. And how precisely it, get, it gets implemented uh, may change over the years, but the actual sort of abstract structure is probably going to be the same or not to change too quickly. 
Uh, but the fact that the system uh, must have this or that piece of gross anatomy, like if the hip bones connected to the knee bone, proverbially, is going is to persist. And again, the details of some specific vendor or technology, SQL, the cloud, AI, whatever, uh, can just be updates to a more robust conceptual model. When we get to system behaviors, um, we're going to see prescriptions and proscriptions that are more and less durable and more and less specific. And if you want an example of these kinds of objects, um, you typically see them in bug reports and unit tests. Uh, they will be the bullet point called expected behavior. Uh, in my experience, these rules are rarely as specific as to dictate uh, the kind of programming language to use or framework or vendor or platform. That's a thing. They could, um, but uh, um, you know they may they may only be relevant to a particular one of those of those things. Uh, but uh, they tend to generalize. Like it wouldn't matter what. Like notwithstanding the fact that you you know you wrote it in a particular programming language, it wouldn't matter. Uh, you know what the behavior would be whether you're writing it in one language or another. So is there precedent for this? Oops, code. Yes, code is code. <laughs> Um, is there precedent? There sure is. So I'm sure some people were waiting for me to get here. Uh, Frank Duffy via Stuart Brand, Shearing Layers uh, and How Buildings Learn, the, uh, the book and the, uh, and the documentary. Documentary takes a lot less time than the book. Um, he lit, uh, and then, of course, um, Pace Layers itself. So the, the, the where are we here? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so the uh, first layer is site, and that's like, uh, so there's going to be over time buildings, you know, are going to, they're going to exist. They're going to be multiple buildings on a given site over thousands of years. Um, next is structure. Um, so any one building, it's going to be the load bearing members of the building. I'll put that one up. So the foundation and the yeah and anything that's actually holding anything up those can last centuries there's even like buildings that are well over a thousand years old and there's buildings that are even older than that uh next is skin so that's the building envelope that's the roof curtain walls windows etc these can last decades to centuries there's services uh, services, so plumbing, electrical, HVAC, elevators, escalators, Wi-Fi, et cetera, years to decades for these guys. Space plan is the non-load-bearing interior walls that partition the space and govern its usage. Um, again, years to decades, but like art galleries, museums, and stuff, we'll be putting up walls and tearing them down every few months. And then finally, stuff. So furniture, merchandise, you know, the things that actually happen inside the building, uh, people, activities, et cetera. Um, so Brand uh, blew this out to civilizational scale, where he said nature changes on the order of thousands, tens of thousands, millions of years, you know, geological times measured in millions of years. Um, culture, hundreds of years to thousands of years. Governance, tens of years to hundreds. Uh, infrastructure, again, sort of tens to hundreds, but not as many. Um, commerce, years to decades. And fashion, which is weeks, months, maybe years. You know, memes last hours to days. So the theme, at least originally, was that each one of these layers would operate in its own domain and the edges would shear against each other. And the idea was, is like nothing penetrated from one layer to the other. Um, so like kind of like the movement of a clock or like an astrolabe or something like that. Um, Brand later de-emphasized the shearing part of the shearing layers. I kind of like it though, because um, yeah, the concerns are considered apart from all the others. That is the, Structure depends on the site, but not the other way around. Fashion depends on commerce, but not the other way around. Uh, but yeah, whether we're talking shearing layers or pace layers, the aspect that is the same is that each layer, yeah, it's its own durability, perishability. Um, 
And like, I'm actually more interested in the relationships between the layers, the sort of one way dependency. So yeah, my contribution is the detail tracks with the parish, the perishability. So um, again, it's kind of, it gets more esoteric as it moves, uh, moves sort of inward. Of course, it's really, really hard to draw because you want to put more stuff in the, in the inside. <laughs> I try. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not satisfied with the, with the, with how that looks. Good. Anyway, so um, I should talk about how I got here. And so this is kind of story time. Uh, I was like a, I sort of have a funny career where I started doing visual design and then I started doing like really heavy back end code stuff in the early 2000s. So it was a junior slash intermediate uh, uh, systems developer. I was working on original infrastructure and I was trying to find a way to do accurate time estimates. Um, so this led me to uh, invent a thing uh, I called behavior sheets. And the way you make a behavior sheet is you get an outliner, any outliner, doesn't matter. And you just start putting down bullet points about like whatever particular software module uh, you intend to write. Uh, you make it sort of a declarative risk, uh, list of, of all of the discrete things that the module must and must not do. Um, I can't really show you a concrete example because they tend to be confidential. Um, but you indent the outline every time there's like a scope change or condition or something like that, like almost like you would be doing code, but not quite. So can you, you continue until you're satisfied that you've exhausted all the things you can say about the module of code without writing any code. That is to say, it's not pseudocode, it's declarative. You're saying must do this, must not do that. So that's kind of like a one-to-one -to, -one to each bullet point. And once you're finished, you eyeball the bullets into four hour chunks. So you just like pull them up together. Um, the four hour chunk thing could be its own talk. I called it the cell. And the idea was uh, just to use a different base unit for time accounting because it was more congruent to what you could get done in a day. Cause like one would be the morning, one would be the evening and then the stretch one maybe or the afternoon, stretch one in the evening maybe. Um, yeah, and so you add those up, you project the result into the calendar, you know, accounting for uh, uh, you know, vacations and holidays and whatever weekends. Um, yeah, so it turns out that uh, behavior sheets are an incredibly reliable uh, way to make a consistently accurate time estimate. So uh, what's the catch? Why isn't everybody using this method? Why am I not like a zillionaire? Um, the catch is that if I started writing a behavior sheet on Monday, I would be able to tell you by lunchtime on Wednesday that the code would be done by end of day Friday. In other words, it was completely useless. It was the, the cost of figuring out the cost of the job was the cost of the job. Um, so, you know, assuming the condition of, of, of you know, the of time estimation is to come up with an estimate quickly, you know, you get into this kind of absurd scenario where you would need an estimate for the estimate for the estimate for the estimate. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, this does not mean that behavior sheets are not worth doing. Oops, what are you? Yeah, does not mean that behavior sheets are not worth doing. Uh, the code that I have written based on behavior sheets is a lot more regimented and organized. That is to say, the code itself was a lot more organized and the process of writing it was a lot more regimented. Uh, because a lot of the questions that I would have had to answer, a lot of the ter determinations that I would have had to make at the code level were already figured out one level chunkier than that. Um, yeah, so behavior sheets, they were useless for predicting the effort, but they were, because they were too expensive in terms of effort, but they were useful for organizing effort. Um, the reason why the code estimates based on behavior sheets were so accurate um, be was because the behavior sheet had wrung out all the surprises. Um, so the behavior sheet was fundamentally like a cheaper medium to do this. Like if I just started writing code, it wouldn't have taken a week. It would have taken way longer. And I wouldn't have been able to tell anybody how long it was going to take at all. So, um, yeah. So it, 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 the, it was considering the, the 
qualitative content of the behavior, uh, not the actual details of how the behavior was implemented. It was just saying what it must and must not do. Um, the other benefit of behavior sheets is that little to none of their details, yes, I would say that already, they just don't deal with any particular programming language because they're slightly more abstract than that. Uh, it means you could write one behavior sheet that prescribes what to do, uh, and it would be the same for Python, JavaScript, you know, Swift, Ruby, whatever. Um, there might be some minor language specific detail, like I'd say like 5% maybe. Uh, and then the time estimates might be incrementally more or less depending on the programming language. Of course, if you're like writing in C, it's gonna take longer. Um, and if you're familiar with programming at all, you'll know that programmers write test suites uh, in code to determine that if the implementation code that they write, as opposed to the test code that they write, exhibits the correct behavior. Um, behavior sheets effectively specify what these test suites should test. And yeah, so pretty much every bullet in a behavior sheet is going to correspond to an individual test case. Um, and this is you know, one thing I could see, but I haven't gotten here yet, is being able to reference a behavior sheet uh, from the unit test or otherwise use the behavior sheet to generate a skeleton for unit tests. Uh, and I wanna say like, this is something I use, like I wanna underscore that this is stuff I have done and still do. Um, Cause like most of the code I write is libraries and a lot of those libraries are spec implementations. Uh, so, you know, once you've made an implementation in language A, it's a heck of a lot less work to write the same thing in language B, again, because you've already rung out a lot of like, how, like if, if most of programming is just like trying to decide how you're gonna represent it. So once you've got done that work once, you can just copy it like modulo the, the details, the language specific details. So where am I here? Um, yeah, so the idea that there could be a medium or representation one step removed from code uh, that could be used to inform parallel implementations of code uh, was things that got was the thing that got moving uh, inside my head. And so what happens is the code is no longer the authoritative place of, of information for anything but the details peculiar to it. Uh, because the description of how the code should behave is being driven from another place. So yeah, you could abstract that away one step, two step, three steps. But moreover, what if you went the other way around? What if you went the other way outside in? So you know the transitions from, you know, like what if you made an unbroken line from business goals to user goals, user goals to user tasks, user tasks to system tasks, system tasks to system behaviors, system behaviors to code. Like what would that look like? Like where is the place in your organization that you can start at the top and actually traverse all the way to like. What is the line of code that does this thing in this uh, you know, part of the business? That's kind of where I want to go. So this has been like bothering me professionally for years. We're into our third decade uh, since the year 2000. Uh, we're part way in at least and two generations into the era of personal computers. And we're still doing an insane amount of work that computers both could and should be doing, and we're doing it by hand. And you know, the situation is not helped by the fact that organizations are highly forget forgetful entities. Uh, policies that get executed that nobody remembers why, we can call those vestiges. I should have made a slide for this. Uh, and then policies that used to work that no longer do, we can call those regressions. Uh, I gotta uh, thank uh, Kartik Agram for that. I really should have done a slide <laughs> for that one one. Uh, but yeah, it's like, you know, not only is the outside environment constantly changing, but people are continually joining and leaving the company and moving around within it. So, you know, at least, you know, part of the problem is that the state of the art of documentation is hot garbage, like still after all this time. Because documentation is, extra work that trails behind the actual work and documentation governance like maintaining the documentation making sure handoffs occur you know making sure that it's like somewhere authoritative people know where it is and so on and so forth is like extra extra work on top of extra work 
And then most documents, uh, most documentation exists in documents and, and documents make lousy documentation. And what I mean by this is like, you know, imagine your kitchen and you've got all kinds of ingredients in the kitchen. Uh, you know, you got dry things, you know, honey lasts thousands of years, uh, literally, you know, there's, they find it in Egyptian tombs and stuff. Um, so yeah, the pasta is going to be still good in a decade. It'll be fine, right? Um, you know, frozen things will last like six months before it gets freezer burned, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, the, the steak, the fish, you know, the, the, the vegetables, like they're not going to last very long. So in this metaphorical framework, a document is kind of like a meal. Uh, it mixes together all the ingredients, not in particularly necessarily those ones. Um, it plates and presents them and it optimizes them for consumption. However, the result is something of the most perishable variety. Like maybe you can freeze it if it's the right kind of thing. Uh, you know, most prepared meals have a pretty short shelf life. You know, you put a burger in a takeout container. You don't want to eat that 20 minutes later even. Um, so yeah, uh, they're way, way, way more perishable than any one of the most perishable ingredients you put in it. And yeah, like leave it any longer and it becomes actual poison. So what I'm uh, uh, arguing here is that documentation needs to be more fluid. Documentation needs to drive development processes rather than trail behind them. It needs to be passively collected and updated wherever possible. So like you're just doing your thing and there's a thing, you know, we're really good at that in the tech industry. Okay, like we are spying on people all the time and socking that in a way in databases. Like, why aren't we doing that for internal processes? Um, yeah, and then it needs to be amenable to repurposing through uh, transformation and recombination. And it needs to be dramatically less work to maintain. We need to be able to precisely target parts of the documentation and update just those parts. We need to be able to ensure that those changes are propagated throughout the organization and potentially beyond. And this is, of course, is covering like a much bigger scope than what I'm trying to cover in this talk. Um, and what I'm presenting is like just one facet of how to tackle this problem. Um, so I don't know if anybody's heard of this acronym FAIR. Um, so like, Findable, it's somewhere you can get it. Accessible, they don't mean it like accessibility. They mean it like uh, addressable. They mean it like you can get it. Uh, interoperable, so open standards and reusable uh, combination and, and so on. Um, and I think this is what needs to happen to decouple documentation from documents. So um, I can show you uh, an example. I'm going to have to change up here. Stop sharing screen. Oops. Oh, I was just sharing the window. You're right. Okay. Okay. Where are we here? Here we are. No, that's not where else. Here we are. Okay. So this is something I'm working on. This is an old, it's an old prototype of a tool, uh, but more importantly, it's a demonstration platform for fair principles. There's about half a dozen kind of experiments going on at once in here. Uh, I actually started working on this thing in 2013 before I even knew what fair was. I don't even think the fair people knew what fair was because they came up with their stuff in 2016. Um, so what you're seeing on the screen is an implementation of Horst Riddle's issue-based information system, or IBIS for short. Uh, Riddle was the guy who coined the term wicked problem. A uh, wicked problem is one where multiple stakeholders, no real clear solutions, there's only better and worse. Uh, so does this sound familiar to like anybody? So IBIS was a, the collaborative process Riddle and his colleagues invented in the 60s. And it's a form of structured argumentation. Uh, and if you heard of structured argumentation, like or Douglas Engelbart in the uh, uh, NLS and so on, 
Uh, but its purpose is to aid in the gener uh, generation of design rationale. And they were implementing it on index cards in the 60s, the one with the knitting, knitting needle. You pull out the, uh, the index cards, um, which was, is crazy. Because, like, there's been other attempts to digitize this thing. They kind of look like files and folders. Um, I decided to go with a wacky graph, uh, hyperbolic graph. I'll get into that in a second. Um, so going all the way back to 1988, and there's like plenty of extant versions. Uh, mine is kind of like a experiment, like I said, there's like half a dozen experiments happening all at once. Um, but I have the lozenge on my screen anyway. Um, so I'll just explain what's going on here. So the, the thing on the left is what you're seeing in context uh, and, the, and it corresponds to the dot in the center. Uh, that's an issue. So an issue, like the red ones are issues. Um, it's a state of affairs uh, in the world you either want to do something about or have to steer around. Um, an issue is responded to by a position. And then again, the, uh, these uh, sort of represent the neighbors, the links in the neighbors uh, uh, of the immediate, uh, of the thing in the center. Uh, so it's sort of the, the, the laws and just replicating what you're seeing on the graph. So a position is an explicit prescription for what you want to do about a particular issue. And these are the green ones. And, and then an argument is why or why not. And I want to say the palette's not final. I mean, none of this is final. I was actually in the middle of rewriting this thing, uh, and then I had to come here. So <laughs> I, I, somebody finally wanted to pay me for this. So, so there, there you go. Um, so issues, positions, and arguments are connected together through a controlled set of semantic relations. So any individual entity can generalize or specialize uh, any other kind of entity of the same kind. So this generalizes these down here. Um, it doesn't matter what any of it, the content of this doesn't, doesn't really super matter. Um, I thought about doing the talk in this thing and I decided against it. Um, so yeah, uh, and any entity in a system can suggest an issue. So this suggests this issue or it can be questioned by an issue. So the, the yellow and orange are suggested and questioned by. Um, any position can respond to any issue. And this does not have an argument for it, but this one does. And then an argument can either support or oppose a position in the, that's like the bright green and red. I think I've just got the green, that's fine. Um, so this is just like nothing is original here. I'm just like implementing the contents of like academic papers. Um, well, the hyperbolic graph, that's me, but, uh, but everything else is just me trying to implement. Um, but like my contribution here is like if I was going to say that the closest thing in this, the closest product to this thing is like an outliner, except that like each bullet point gets its own web page. Uh, furthermore, each bullet point is like a durable permalink um, that you can point to directly. It will never 404 unless you're dumb enough to delete it. Um, and then finally, each bullet point is connected to its neighbors using a controlled vocabulary of semantic relations. Uh, and then we can use those to compute. Uh, so this tool is like fully transparent with respect uh, to its instance data and the schema that powers it. And like if some, that means like if somebody else is going to make a completely different tool, they, they could just dump the data out of this and load it into that, it'll be fine. Uh, you know, and vice versa, we'll go back and forth. So the connection to the specificity gradient this thing uh, is, is that, is that you can see that, that this kind of has a sense and there's a small number of things in the middle and a large number of things toward the edges. And like when you get out to the edge, you can kind of see that like, oh, I'm in the weeds here because it kind of rebases the center to be sort of far away. And then you kind of get, you know, this, is the, this is the best I could come up with to, to draw this stuff because you get more stuff. So it's kind of like an inverted flip. You got, it takes some getting used to. This is why this is not a product yet. Um, where are we here? So I also have um, verticals 
uh, for specific design disciplines. So I have a robust content inventory vocabulary that's like this, where I do like audiences and like anti audiences, and then you can like filter content based on that. Um, and I got an interaction design vocabulary, which is like in the works as well. And I also have like a general purpose process model vocabulary that like extends this IBIS stuff with like uh, uh, expectations for like time and money and people and who's going to actually, rather than like, I want to do this, it's like, I'm going to do this. And then um, again, like everything is fully addressable. Um, yeah, so, so the idea is that to pulverize the information and make every little tiny piece of it something you can point directly at and then make the content, the actual payload of it to be structured so that it can be computed over. Uh, and since it's fair and open, it can interoperate with a wider tooling ecosystem. And so what I ask of you as I draw this talk to a close is to demand more from your tools. I salute you all, we made it. Have a great afternoon.